Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's so great to have so many visitors here this morning. We're really happy to have you with us in our midst, but there's a particularly special visitor um, that I'm really uh, honored and excited to have here this morning, and that's, that's my mom. Um, would you give it up for, for my mom? Um, it's really special to have you here today on Mother's Day, and just was thinking about it last night when I found out you're coming today. I was like, man, what a cool moment to be able to have you here. And most of you, um, if you know me, you know, you know, my parents, my family a little bit, and my mom's a huge influence in my life as so many levels, but most importantly, as a follower of Jesus. And I was thinking about you last night and thought of this verse in Psalm 27. The psalmist says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. I didn't plan on getting emotional, but um, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And I thought, man, that's, that's my mom. And some people say that for me, like on this stage of life, right? And I'm confident in the Lord and that I will see the goodness of the land of the living, but I'm grateful to have a mom who I'm like, man, you just didn't sit back and say, I'm confident I'm going to see this. You fought for the goodness of the Lord. You've created living by the power of the Holy Spirit. So thank you. Thank you for your influence in my life and as a family and as a church family as well. So I want to honor you. And uh, yeah, you can give it up for my mom again. (laughs) Our new life mama as well, Mama Millie's cooking. So there's... Yeah, there's uh, going to be food downstairs. Come, come down and join us afterwards. One of the things my mom passed on to me and to our whole family is a, a love of plants. Uh, we, we have, yeah, true. <laughs> it's like, that's, this is going to get an amen from Jew. Um, we, we love plants as a family. We have it all uh, over in our yard, in our house. And Adria got me this plant I don't know, three or four years ago uh, for my birthday. And anyone know the name of this plant? Just fun fact. No? Okay. Swiss cheese plant, basically, it's called Monastero, I think. Um, yeah, Swiss cheese plant, it's got a bunch of holes, and it's viney, it grows. Uh, and so this plant, I was super excited about it, put it up in my room and let it just do its thing, and it did its thing. It was growing and growing. It got to maybe, I don't know, six or eight feet. Um, and it was just, I thought it was just going to keep going. Um, but then it started to have yellow leaves, that would fall off because there was a deficiency with the character of the caretaker. (laughs) Me. It's not Adria. I love plants, but I also love being stingy sometimes. So it's growing. It's doing great. I don't believe in plant food. my mom gave me plant food, in fact, and it wound up just getting old in the closet. I never even gave it to the plants. I'm like, y'all, you got this, okay? You don't need extra help. Um, I didn't give it any plant food. I gave it water. I didn't give it any extra dirt. It just kept growing and growing, and I never really gave it any special attention. And wouldn't you know that all of its producing and doing without the resources to match that just wasn't sustainable, the yellow leaves started falling to the point I said, all right, well, I've got I've to kick it into gear. I have to cut off a bunch of it, had to add some more dirt to it, um, still get in the water. I've been faithful in watering it. But I was thinking about this and thinking about uh, the idea, the reality of a lifestyle of mercy, of growing and doing and meeting needs. And I was thinking about that and thought, how do we sustain a lifestyle like that? Maybe some of you this morning have been meeting needs for a long time, but you're feeling the yellow leaves, right? You're like, things are falling in a little bit more, and I'm not as eager to keep growing or keep doing or keep going. See, in preaching the Word, 
we're preaching to a specific congregation, a specific, specific location, right? This is the, where the Word of God meets us as New Life Community Church in Humble Park. So if you're visiting this morning, I invite you to listen in, and I don't know where you're at this morning, but knowing our church, bless you, knowing our church, I thought, what we don't need is for me to come and say, y'all need to be more merciful, meet more needs. But what we do need is to know how do we sustain a lifestyle of mercy, How do we sustain a lifestyle of mercy? Jesus uh, has this, as we've been calling it, the preamble to the kingdom constitution. We're talking about the pursuit of happiness. Uh, We're going through a series on the Beatitudes, these really countercultural ways of living, ways of, of being that are represented by the people who are in front of Jesus. Uh, the, the poor, those who have been sick and now been healed, those who are not the first people in society to say, y'all are going to do some amazing things. And Jesus has them in front of them and is saying, no, you, the poor in spirit, you who are mourning, you who are meek, you, you are the ones who are going to be the foundation for this kingdom. In this morning's passage in Matthew 5, verse 7 says this, it says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Good morning, Destiny. Thank you for coming. It's good to see you. What is mercy? Like, what, what is this word he's throwing out there? We know we throw it out and use it pretty regularly. I want to make sure we're on the same page when we talk about mercy. Mercy is uh, when you see a need and you feel it, like, man, I gotta do something, right? And then you do something. And we know that it's possible to not even see a need, but just sort of be told about it, and you're like, great, I'm gonna do something, or to see a need and to feel it and be like, "Uh, but that's it, I can't do anything about it. Um, Or to see a need and you're like, you know what, I just sort of feel bad and I'm gonna meet it, but there's not that feeling, right? They talk about it like a, a, like an upset stomach, right? It's like in your bowels, like I have got to do something that causes you to, to get down and say, man, like how do we meet this need? I think about it as, as a parent, right? When your child is upset and you get down at their level, you say, like, what's going on? You're coming down to empathize and then you got to meet that need. And for some of you this morning, talking about this on Mother's Day is very apt. Like, yeah, that's my mom. But I want to acknowledge that for some of you, it's a painful reminder of the lack of mercy that you received in your life. And as Tracy said earlier, we we just want you to know we see you. We acknowledge that it's not, not everyone received the sort of mercy they should have from their parents, from their mom. But this is what mercy is. It sees the need. There's a recognition. It's moved by the need. There's this motivation. And then there's a move to meet the need. Action. If we're honest, mercy is a little bit uh, more in vogue in this season. Right? Like mercy sells. We've combined mercy and capitalism super well. Um, I almost wore my Toms this morning because they're a great example. They're like the OG example. Uh, thank you, James. You've got your Toms. Thank you. I couldn't on Mother's Day because Adrian really hates my Toms. So um, there's, <laughs> there's that. Um, but yeah, wear good, share good. Like I can wear something that I want anyways and I can feel good because it's helping someone. Praise the Lord, right? And, like, this isn't necessarily bad. Like, that's actually pretty cool and amazing that some of these initiatives are, are there. Like, that's incredible. But even modern mercy has its limits. There are people that we are like, they deserve mercy. But there's a whole list of, let's call them wicked folk, right? Other people who we say, nah, they, they don't deserve mercy. I'm sure we all have our categories or our people that we would include in there, maybe at a very personal level, maybe at a broader level, like, you know, who deserves punishment and not mercy, the rich or the bigots or the racists or the sexists. Like, we just put these labels like, they don't deserve mercy. What's ironic is that God, when he came, he startled us by saying, like, our God is a God of mercy who sends rain and sunshine on everyone the wicked and the righteous. Like, if that's not unsettling, like, he's like, no, there's no category of people who don't need my mercy and who I don't want to show my mercy to. 
You say, well, that's not me. I'm, I'm really merciful. Um, I meet needs of everyone. Praise the Lord. I am grateful for that. But unsustained mercy, beloved, is a really dangerous way of living your life. Unsustained mercy is like going bungee jumping and you don't have the cord ho- holding on. You're just, you're going for it. It's fun for a moment, but you are not going to, to be able to, to survive that sort of lifestyle. Because mercy is a powerful, powerful thing. It's a way of imitating God. And what happens with the, the, the best of ways when you're imitating God over and over again, you're meeting needs and you might even wind up feeling like God. That I'm meeting all these other needs. Oh, these people need me, and I feel it, and I'm meeting needs. And you stop realizing that you have needs. You feel almost like you're like, God, like, what would they do without me? And you stop even asking for mercy, realizing you need mercy. Now you're just on your own. You're not being sustained by mercy. Or on the other end, it can lead to, to burnout and fatigue, If you hear this phrase, compassion fatigue, thinking especially of those nurses and those working constantly with people who have need, it's like, man, over and over again, every single day, you're being bombarded with needing to meet needs, and it's wearing you down. Mercy is a dangerous thing. How do we sustain a lifestyle of mercy? Jesus says this, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And how I want to word it today is this, that sustaining a lifestyle of mercy requires, you've got to have the sustaining mercy of God. If you want to live a lifestyle of mercy where on a regular basis you're able to be a merciful person, you have to have the mercy of God that you are experiencing in your life. You could read this verse and say, like, so I have to be merciful to gain mercy. Is that how this works? I've got to do this or be that before I experience mercy. I don't read it this way. I don't think that's the the faithful way of reading this text. I think it's the way of reflecting the, the community that you're part of, the community of the merciful God. If you're part of the blessed community, the one who finds themselves within the vicinity of Jesus, under the rule and reign of Jesus, you're part of those who have experienced the mercy of God. So blessed are those who are merciful, for they are the same ones who receive mercy. You're part of the community of mercy. As a church, we're part of the community of mercy by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a way of being that is part of who God is that we are brought into. And it is his mercy that sustains us. And praise God, beloved, he's not stingy like I am with his plants. This this morning, to talk about the sustaining mercy of God, I just want to go through Scripture in a brief manner, but I'm going to term it this way, a smorgasbord of Scripture. Any of you know what a smorgasbord is? Where are my Swedish folk at? James, perfect, yep. Growing up in Wisconsin, we have some Swedish communities. Smorgasbord is like a... (laughs) Mariah, your face, yep. A smorgasbord is basically like a Swedish buffet, just a whole bunch of food, right? You just get stuffed on a smorgasbord. It's such a great word too, right? Just drop that. Today, we're going to have a smorgasbord. What? Smorgasbord of scriptures to help us see the mercy that is available to us. The first uh, verse I want to see is where the storyteller Moses in Exodus 34, he shared this. He said, the Lord passed in front of him, passed in front of Moses, and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God. You ever have people where they just sort of like spout off who they are or what they do, and you're not really asking for that? And you get the feeling that they're maybe not even really good at what they're saying. Like you bump into someone and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, uh, I played college ball and this and that, and you're like, I didn't ask or don't particularly care, and I'm not convinced that you're very good because you're really trying to convince me, right? But it's the folks who sort of stay behind a little bit, and in your moment where you need to know with certainty someone's skill, it's interesting when those, those folks begin to speak up. Like, hey, I've been a, a plumber for 35 years. 
If you just say that out of the blue, I, great, cool, that's awesome. But when you say that and you know I am in need of plumbing help, you're saying this to bring assurance to my spirit. You can listen in. You can trust me. This is who I am. I am a plumber through and through. I'm not, beloved. I am not. Don't come to me other than for recommendations. Um, but you know, when that person says that, like, I've been, I've been a doctor for 38 years. It's like, Man, I need to know that. I need your wisdom. And they're saying that to say, you can trust me. And it's the first way that the Lord describes himself in a list that will go on for a couple of verses. The first thing that he says is, Moses, I want you to know the Lord, the Lord is compassionate. What's compassionate? It's that heart that says, I, I, I want to get down and do something in your situation. Israel, I've seen you in bondage and I have acted on your behalf because I have a heart of compassion. It's the same heart that a mother has for her child in the womb. Her child, when it comes out and is crying, and said, I got to do something, that heart. I've got a heart of compassion and gracious heart. I don't just feel this way, but I act this way to alleviate the need. How do we sustain a lifestyle of mercy? God's mercy can sustain us because that's who he is. That's who he is every day. Secondly, let's let the gospel writer Luke uh, speak into this. God's mercy can sustain us because he's got a proven track record. He's been showing mercy for a long, long time. Luke, uh, father, or the father of John in Luke, puts it this way in chapter 1. He says, because of God's merciful compassion, basically heart of tender mercy, just like just wanting us to know it's this heart of beating with mercy. Because of that mercy, the dawn from on high will visit us. This beautiful description of the incarnation of Jesus. The dawn from on high will visit us to shine on those who live in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. This is who our God is. He's got a proven track record because of the very heart of mercy of our God. Jesus has come. He has heard our cry as we sung about this morning. He has seen our play and said, I am going to do something. That's part of our story, church. That is who our God is. That's his proven track, rec proven track record. God's mercy can sustain us because it's already met our greatest need. The follower of Jesus named Paul, he puts it this way in Titus. He says, at one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. If you find yourself somewhere in that category, you're welcome to raise your hand with me. You don't have to, but that's like all of us, right? All of us. Unless we think that there are those people who God says, I don't want to have mercy on you. You're just, you know, annoying and obnoxious and you don't like me. It's this group of people that then the gospel writer or the writer Paul says this, when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, appeared in the person of Jesus Christ, he saved us. Well, maybe it's because of the righteous things we've done, Paul. No, not because of the righteous things we had done. In fact, it's because of his mercy, his heart. It says, those folks who are doing everything that is displeasing me, that I should just say, like, I want nothing to do with you, but I want to get down at their level in the person of Jesus Christ. I want to save them from their sins. That's who he is. That's his proven track record. His mercy has already met our greatest needs, so why wouldn't I come to him day in and day out and say, God, I need your mercy to sustain this life. That's what he wants to do on our behalf. God's mercy can sustain us because he's got plenty of it, church. He's got plenty of mercy. I find it so interesting the way the, the writers describe it. Paul, again, he says in Ephesians, Ephesians 2, God, who is, someone say it, rich in mercy. He's loaded with mercy. He says, mercy, 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 mercy all day long. Mercy, mercy, mercy. He doesn't have to say that. The writer could just say, God, who's merciful. He, he wants you to know that he's rich in mercy, lest you think that today he doesn't want to be merciful towards you. No, he is rich in mercy. 
because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, praise Jesus. Even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. You are saved by grace. We can rush around, we can say, oh, I know I'm saved by grace, but man, I better be doing stuff for Jesus to like really be pleased with me, right? I know he loved me enough to get me into his kingdom, but now he probably expects like this, and if I'm not matching that, he's just shaking his head. Our God is rich in mercy. He's not like me, just saying like, you got enough to survive, plant. Keep going. And it's screaming. It's like, hey, I don't have enough. I can drop in one yellow leaf. I'm like, what's your problem? Keep going. Our God is rich in mercy. He wants to put all the nutrients in. Keep going, but I'm going to give you what you need. God's mercy can sustain us because he's got plenty of it. God's mercy can sustain us because it's constant. It is constant. Jeremiah wrote in Lamentations at a horrible time, city of Jerusalem, their their hometown destroyed. And he says this about the Lord. He says, because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish. Why? For his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. What a way to start your day. God's mercy is new every morning. I wake up in the morning exhausted, like, wait, another day. You know, some of those days you have. God's mercies, they're new every day. Man, I got mercy for you, James. And you, James. We got a lot of James in the house this morning. We got mercy for you. We got mercy for you. New every morning. His mercy is constant. God's mercy can sustain us because it's constant Lee on the throne, beloved, the writer of Hebrews, he puts it this way, or she, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. This means that he gets down at our level, he says, I know what it's like. I know. I know what it's like. And then it says this, therefore let us approach the throne of grace. Who sits on a throne? God, kings, people in charge. Tomorrow's inauguration day in the city. The new mayor will be ushered in. And he comes from the west side. So people on the west side, not necessarily all of them, but a large portion feel like this person understands what it's like and now he's in the highest position, right? That's a small glimpse of who our God is. He is on the throne, So his mercy can sustain us because it's constantly on the throne. He's in charge and he knows what it's like. That is who he is. That's where he's at. He is constantly on the throne inviting us to come ask for help. This verse continues on. It says, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, confidently, like, hey, like we belong there. It's crazy that we belong in the presence of God so that we, you and I, may receive mercy. That we would receive God's mercy. Where his heart says like, Danny, I want to I wanna meet your need. Like, I hear your cry. Like, like traced into the He's not saying like, no, 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 why why are you here? You need to be out doing like, no, he's like, no, I hear your cry. I'm actually inviting you to come to the throne of grace to find mercy and grace in time of need. That's our God. That's who he is. This is how we sustain a lifestyle of mercy. By going to to, to the king of kings and the Lord of lords, I need help. I need help again. Jesus, you wouldn't believe it. I know it was just five minutes ago. I need help again. Yeah, I got plenty of mercy for you, Isaac. And my heart is one to meet that need, and I have the resources to meet that need. I see your need, I have the heart to meet it, and I will meet it. By the way, this Thursday is uh, when the church traditionally celebrates Ascension Day. An amazing day, right? Yeah, Christmas day we celebrate Jesus being born, Easter, Jesus defeating death. This Thursday we celebrate Jesus going away. Why are we celebrating that? Because he went and it's at the right hand of the Father. Like he's on the throne. He gave us his Holy Spirit to say, you have access. Anytime, 
Anytime, day or night, middle of the night, your child's crying, here I am, cry out to me. Ascension Day, this Thursday, how do we sustain a lifestyle of mercy, beloved? Sustaining a lifestyle of mercy requires the sustaining mercy of God. I want to make three observations as we close. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up. The first is this, prune our pride and notice our need. Right? It's easy when we're meeting needs all day long with our family, with work, for our own needs to, to forget that we have needs that we say, God, only you can meet this. Only you can give me strength. Maybe some of our areas of our lives need to be pruned. I, I can't do all this. I've got to cut this out. It's like falling apart. So God, I've got to go back to where I rely on you. I've got to start from that place. Prune your pride and notice your need. Peter puts it this way, like, humble yourselves before, the, before God. Cast your cares on him because he will care for you. Secondly is this, allow mercy to go to new areas. Allow mercy to go to new areas. There are certain writers throughout Scripture who were bothered by God's mercy. One in particular, Jonah. He goes and he's, you know, long story, doesn't want to go to Nineveh, eventually gets to Nineveh, and he's bothered because God has mercy on Nineveh. And he actually accuses him. He says, I knew you would do this because you're merciful. I knew you would see their need, you would feel a certain way, and look at you, now you're having mercy on them. And I don't know about you, but you, you have people in your life, you say, God, I don't actually want them to experience mercy. Not that group of people. And what you do is you're telling the plant, like, this is where you have to grow. Grow and flourish where I allow you to. Just, oh, keep growing. Keep growing. And God's like, that's not my mercy. My mercy's expanding, it's going, it's reaching out, new borders, new areas. I want more and more people to experience my mercy. I don't want you to limit my mercy, Isaac. You receive from me and tell me where should my mercy go. Lastly, go to the throne, beloved. Over and over and over and over and over and over again. Your friend might get tired by your need. Your spouse will get tired by your need. You'll be tired by your need. God is not going to be tired by your need. It actually fills him with great joy when you say, I need you. I need your help. Jesus on the throne is like, I know. I got everything you need. Come, come, come. Keep coming. Would you stand? Would you stand with me? If you're here this morning and, and you've never put your trust in Jesus Christ, you say, I need to get my life right, I need to, to get it all sorted out, and then I'll go experience mercy, that's, that's not what you need to do. God saved us, not when we were worth saving, but because of his mercy, it gave him so much joy to come save us and would give him so much joy today to say, come, ask for forgiveness, ask for my help, and I will save you. If that's you this morning, during this song, I'd love for you to come talk with me, talk with my wife. Or if you're here this morning, say, man, I just need, I just need more of Jesus. Praise God, that's me, that's, that's us, that's the church. We need more of Jesus. So I'm going to encourage you as we sing this song, just to either sing loudly, proclaim it, maybe take time to sit, however you want to do it. But Lord, we thank you that your mercy for us is constant. It's constantly on the throne and it's inviting us to come, God. Would you sustain our life as a church, God, by your mercy? In Jesus' name, amen.